I believe that the study of mathematics should give pupils an opportunity to think through problems and not to do not necess- and not necessarily rely on the ability to record well-known mathematical facts and techniques. And in my papers, I have tried to write some questions which reflect this belief. And this was the first one. And it seems dated now. And I noticed going back 30 years, one of the things that I noticed is that all the questions seem to be text in terms of men. I was teaching them a mix, two and a half thousand strong mix, London Comprehensive. While I should get this men bit out, I don't know. I certainly wouldn't do that now. That was the question. I expect you can predict what happened. The question caused quite a stir. I thought it was fairly unique and I expected that it was not one which would have been predicted by teachers. I spent much of my life predicting what the examination questions would be at O level and A level and so on. Yeah? And I was pretty good at it. I had not, however, expected the teacher's reaction. They wrote to the examination board and complained that the question was unfair. And it was not on the syllabus that children did not have red pens. In my my own school, a teacher who was invigilating the exam came up to the staff room and started collecting red pens. This is absolutely true, and I still have dinner with a boy I taught who then became a colleague and is now a friend, long-term friend, and we meet occasionally, have a meal, and he still talks about it because he witnessed this happening. (laughs) That red men were not necessarily logical, and that if I wanted to write a question about base three, we used to have such fun then, Dave, base three. I should do so, and so on, and so on. Remember, it reminds me of another story. I was at the Beck Show, not this year, but last year. And an, an Asian guy came up to me. He said, I remember you. He said, your name's Ibs, isn't it? I said, yes. He said, and I remember a lesson you taught when you came into the room pretending to be a Martian. <laughs> Oh, and what I'd done was I got my arm tied up behind my back and I got my sweater down, I had this sleeve and I went in and waving and I said, I've only got five fingers, we're going to count base five, blah, 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 you know. Sort of... He said, I still remember that. He said, you're also the only person I have ever known who taught me how to subtract binary numbers without subtraction. He said, I've never seen that since. I said, yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? Actually, I said, write to the TES, tell them your favourite maths teacher. (laughs) Somebody out there that owes me. What this lad didn't know was that at the end of this, I've told this story lots and lots of times because it it so impacted on me. What they didn't realise was that I was standing there in front. At the end of this lesson, this this was a mixed ability class. I've been teaching them over a term. At the end of this lesson, this little lad stayed behind and he came up to me with this worried expression on his face. And he said, you're not really from Mars, are you? <laughs> and, and as he said this, he ran his little fingers up and down my ribcage until eventually he found my arm and this worried expression turned into a smile. Teachers, you have no idea the power you hold. (laughs) I always contrast that story. I went to the States to see my brother, and I came back with all this sort of stupid American garb that high school kids in America were wearing, you jackets with (laughs) coats, the real thing, and the stars and stripes and all this sort of stuff. And I thought I would give an assembly about what I 
well, I was horrified, really. My brother was living one side of an artificial line. There was a swimming pool and everything that I suppose the American dream could offer. And the other side of the line, in Mexico, people were living in dried-out riverbeds in cardboard boxes. And I, this, this left an impression. And I thought I'd share this with the kids, and I told them all about it. This assembly, I told them all about this. So I was wearing this American gun. I said, this is Crownwood School's uniform 10 years' time. Upsetting a few of my colleagues as I walked in. In the melee after this assembly, a little girl came, well, not a little girl, a, a, a young woman came up to me. It must have been Y9 or 10. She tapped me on the shoulder and she said, you're not really a racing car driver, are you? The opposite. You can have all that power, the power of persuasion, and sometimes it just seems to dissipate into nothing. She had not heard a word. So that was my first attempt. It caused a rumpus. People were writing to me and saying, it's unfair on my kids, this question. And I was writing back and said, if you can demonstrate why it's unfair on your children as a, about any other school, any authority, then we will think about it. It was the same. It was a fair enough. I wrote a question not because I wanted to test the candidate's ability to remember working in base three. That was not the point. But because I wished to give them an opportunity to tackle a question from first principles. In short, a question which would indicate whether they or not they could think for a problem, not a question which depended on them having been taught a particular topic, a question of process rather than a question of what the complainers did not know was this question was the highest scoring question on the paper. <laughs> and some children answered this question and no other. What the complainers did not know was this question was the highest scoring one of the two papers and that my assistant examiners were suggesting that it was too easy. <laughs> That was after marking a large number of strips. Because these kids sat there and worked it through. What was clear was the question had been answered very well by a large number of candidates who had done very little else in the examination. They read the question, they followed the instructions, they thought through the problem, they did not use principles of base three but principles of common sense and pattern to arrive at the answers. They use the very qualities which teachers commonly say their children do not possess. The very qualities which I believe are most important in mathematics. There are, of course, questions on, there are, of course, questions on my paper of a more conventional nature. And these provided me with a comparison. It's easier for me to write questions about trig and bearings and algebra than it is to con, in fact, this is my public apology to Brian Weller, who provided me with all these questions. Brian, thank you. He knows, we discussed it, but he was the author of most of this work. In my experience, there's been an overall tendency for candidates to do better on questions for which they have not received specific training. What a statement. And you know why this is. It's because whatever happens, the teacher builds up the, level, the next layer. So that mystery is being built on mystery. I didn't understand that. I didn't understand the other. I start going into a maths lesson not expecting to understand. And it's just like a layer of an onion. 